Hey y'all, how's it going? With it being the 10th anniversary of War Thunder, I thought I'd go back and check out a jet that's been in the game since War Thunder went into open beta. So come join me as we dive into the German HE-162. By late 1944, the Luftwaffe found themselves in a dire situation. Allied bombing raids against German industrial and logistical targets were relentless and trying to defend against these raids was bleeding the Luftwaffe white of both planes and pilots. The Germans needed to come up with some way to turn the tide of the air war. There were two competing plans on how to do this. The first was championed by Luftwaffe general and ace Adolf Galland. He reasoned that to fight against the superior Allied numbers, the Germans needed superior technology. Thus, the production of the ME-262A1A should be prioritized over all other types. The second was supported by Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring and Armaments Minister Albert Speer. They both supported a light fighter that would be cheap and easy to manufacture and could also be thrown away and replaced with a new one off the assembly line if it had ever become damaged or worn out. This later plan would be selected mainly due to the support of the more powerful German government officials, but also due to the ME-262's poor reliability problems being too big of a strain for Germany's current logistical shortcomings. So requirements were put forward to the German aircraft manufacturers on September 10, 1944. These manufacturers only had 10 days to submit their designs for the competition. This just goes to emphasize how much pressure they were under to find a solution to Allied air superiority. Now, the basic specifications put forward for this light fighter were that it must use a BMW 003 jet engine as to not compete for engines with the ME-262 or AR-234. The airframe needed to incorporate wood and other non-strategic materials so it was easy and cheap to produce, assembly needed to be done by unskilled or slave labor, it needed to weigh no more than 4,400 pounds on takeoff, have a maximum speed of over 470 miles per hour, endurance of at least 30 minutes, a short takeoff run, an armament of either two MG-151s or two Mark 108s, and finally, it needed to be simple to fly. This last point was very important as Germany was short on skilled pilots. So it was planned to use quickly trained Hitler Youth Aviators to fly these planes in combat. Because of this, the plane was given the nickname Volksjäger, which means People's Fighter. Since this contract would entail the winner building a large number of aircraft, just about every manufacturer in Germany participated. However, there was only one standout design, and that was the one put forward by Heinkel. This was solely because they had been working on just such a design on their own time for the past year, so they had a massive head start on design work. That made it a no-brainer to go with this design in the situation the Luftwaffe found themselves in. By December 6, 1944, the first prototype was ready and made its maiden flight with Floyd Kapitän Gotthold Peter at the controls. The flight went relatively smoothly until the glue holding the nose gear strut door failed. Peter safely landed the plane, but the glue problem would continue, and on the second flight, an aileron detached, causing the plane to crash and kill the pilot. There were other problems that were discovered as well, but testing would be forced to continue quickly despite these setbacks. With the second, third, and fourth prototypes coming online between mid-December 1944 and mid-January 1945. Official production began in January 1945 with the initial HE-162A1 variants being equipped with two Mark 108s. However, after the first 50 examples, this was swapped to two MG-151s as the Mark 108 was too much for the small, lightly built airframe to handle. Despite the design calling for the plane to be flown by inexperienced Hitler Youth pilots with little training, the aircraft proved far too complex and experienced pilots were needed to fly it. The HE-162 was delivered to the first and only operational unit, JG-1, in February 1945. The HE-162 would first see combat in mid-April, and on April 19th, the HE-162 would record its first kill when Gunther Kirchner shot down an RAF fighter. Later that same day, he would be shot down by an RAF Tempest and would die after ejecting. Due to the HE-162 having a top-mounted engine right behind the cockpit, it was actually equipped with an ejection seat to safely get the pilot away. During its brief service, the ejection seat was used four times. 
Two attempts were successful and two were failed, ending in the pilot's deaths. JG-1 would continue to score kills in April, but went on to lose 13 airframes and 10 pilots. Only two of the 13 aircraft lost were due to enemy action. The rest were due to structural failure, engine flameouts, or from running out of fuel. All HE-162s would be grounded on May 5, 1945, when the German armed forces in the Netherlands, Northwest Germany, and Denmark surrendered. Overall, German and Allied pilots who flew the HE-162 after the war praised its speed, maneuverability, and aerodynamic balance. Most of the problems the HE-162 would suffer were mainly due to it being rushed into production and not any fault of the design itself. In War Thunder, we get two versions of the HE-162, the A-1 as a special reward vehicle and the A-2 as a tech tree variant. The only difference between the two is their armament and the SL modifier. Since I only have the tech tree version, we'll focus on that. So the HE-162 A-2 is armed with two MG-151 20mm cannons. Each gun has access to 120 rounds of ammo, and with its fire rate of 700 rounds per minute, you'll have a trigger time of around 10.3 seconds. These guns will be very familiar to any German pilot, so getting the hang of leading them won't be that hard. Just keep in mind when fighting other jets, you'll probably need to lead a bit more due to the increased speeds. With the upgraded belts, these guns pack a nice punch and will quickly down most opponents if you get some good hits in on them. Okay, so I already spaded this plane a long time ago, so to replicate being completely stuck, I unequipped all the modules and played a few games to get a feel for it. The 162 is definitely a lot more sluggish without all of the upgrades. So when you start unlocking modules, you want to focus on the new ammo belts, compressor, and engines first. The default belt is just absolutely trash, and you need the new ammo types just so you can actually do some good damage. As for the engine and compressor module, they just give you some extra thrust, which is very much appreciated on this jet. With my premium account, I was averaging about two to 3,000 RP with at least one kill per game. With each module requiring between 8 to 14k RP, it should only take the average player around 6 to 12 games to unlock them, I'd say. If this is your first jet, maybe add a couple more to that estimate as you're learning to fly the plane. So it shouldn't take too long for that matter. After getting those modules, you can work on the rest of the performance mods and then get the gun upgrade last. Reason being is the base accuracy on the 20mm is good enough and they don't overheat quickly, so you're not in a rush to get that module. The HE-162 is powered by a single BMW 003 axial flow turbojet engine capable of producing 910 kgf of thrust. This engine can push the 162 up to 453 knots, according to the stat card. In reality, you won't be hitting those speeds unless you come out of a dive, as you just run into an acceleration wall around 350 knots. You'll still gain speed, it'll just be incredibly slow after that point. As for wing rip speeds, you can actually reach up to 560 knots on the deck before they rip, which for a plane made out of wood, I don't think should be the case, but all well, Gaijin. Really, you won't have to worry about this that often, as to even reach that speed, you have to dive from like 32,000 feet, which you're never going to get up to in normal gameplay. While ripping your wings isn't something you really have to worry about, the heavy compression you'll experience after around 450 knots is actually something you'll have to pay attention to. Since this is an early jet, also keep in mind that the engine will lag a second or two behind your control inputs, so you can't rapidly throw your throttle around and expect the engine to keep up with you like you can in props. The last thing to mention is you do have a power boost option where you can throw the engine into 108%. This will give you a little more power but will quickly cause your engine to overheat. So be sure to use this sparingly and don't leave it on for too long. On paper, the rate of climb when spaded is pretty impressive at 4,600 feet per minute. This is comparable or even better than some of the super props you end up facing. However, in-game performance doesn't lead you to the same conclusion the paper stats would. You end up being outclimbed by props most of the time, and that's mainly due to how you optimally climb in a jet versus a prop. In a prop, you can climb at a steep angle compared to an early jet, which climbs best at a shallow angle and high speed. 
This is because jet engines produce more power the faster you are going. So by the time you meet the props, they'll generally be at a higher altitude than you. As for maneuverability, it's pretty good for a starter jet. You can hang with all but the best turning props for the first turn or two. After that though, you'll have trouble keeping up as you've bled out most of your speed by this point. This is because the HE-162 has horrible energy retention and even the slightest nudge will drop your speed a good bit. So any hard maneuvering will quickly bleed any energy you have. Still, you can use this quick energy loss to your advantage to sit behind an opponent pretty reliably. The HE-162 is also an excellent defensive flyer. The tiny airframe means you're a tough target to actually hit, and the maneuverability combined with a solid roll rate means you can dodge out of the way of a lot of shots if you're paying attention. Fuel choice is a major question here, and you can either go with 7 minutes to maximize your performance, or you can take a little bit of a hit and go with 20 minutes so that you have some longer legs. Personally, I flip-flopped a lot between these two options, and I don't have a good answer for y'all. Really, it's just going to come down to your personal taste and how you play the plane. So just try both fuel settings out and then stick with the one you prefer the most. Alright, let's get into how I actually play the HE-162. Since this is a BR 6.0, you'll end up in a fair amount of down tiers as you often get matched with JU-288s on your team. This means you'll be the fastest plane around, but also one of the few fighters on your team. So at the start of the match, I like to climb a little bit so I have some altitude to exchange for speed if I need to catch up to or run away from someone. I'll accelerate up to 300 knots after takeoff and then pitch up into a 5 to 10 degree climb while trying to maintain my speed above 270 knots. Enemy props will still end up above you, but it won't be a massive gap. Stay along the edge of the battle at the start and wait for your friendly prop fighters to drag down the enemy or for the enemy to go after your 288s. Here is where you can use your higher speed to quickly close the gap and jump them. Use boom and zoom tactics and remember to keep your speed up at all times. If you're planning to turn around to come back for another pass, do a quick check to make sure no one can jump you when you're slow. The main thing to remember is that you're a great supporting fighter, but if you get dragged into a dogfight against a prop, there's not a lot you can do to shake them on your own, so keeping your teammates alive is very important for your own success. You won't only get down tiers though and will end up facing other jets. Most of these will be faster than you and they'll also out accelerate you. However, you do generally turn better than most of them. So at the start of the game, you still want to climb a bit on the edge before moving in to support your team, only now you can use the HE-162's good first turn maneuverability to get in behind some of your opponents and get a shot with your MG-151s. If you ever get someone behind you, pay attention to where they're trying to lead you, then roll and pull out of the way. If you get good at this, you can be a very annoying plane to actually hit. Oh, and one more thing, if you're in a low altitude, low speed dogfight, don't pull into a vertical. I learned that one the hard way, so don't make the same mistake I did. Alright, it's time to talk economics. The HE-162A2 is a German Rank 5 BR 6.0 starter jet in the secondary fighter line. Fun little fact, this is the lowest BR jet available as a tech tree aircraft. The only other jet at a lower BR is the American Event Premium P-59A. To unlock the HE-162 will require 95,000 RP and to purchase it will set you back 270,000 SL. Basic crew training cost is 78,000 SL, Expert will set you back another 270,000 SL, and to get the ACE qualification will require you to either pay 1.5,000 GE or gain 670,000 RP while playing the aircraft. If you want to throw a talisman on, that will cost you 2,000 GE. To fully spade the plane will require you to earn 83.4 thousand RP and will cost 134 thousand SL. When fully spaded, the repair cost is 14,690 SL. This is more expensive than the other BR 6.0 fighters. Though those tend to be props, however even when you compare it to other starter jets, it's one of the more expensive. Finally, the HE-162A2 gets an SL modifier of 3 and an RP modifier of 1.9. 
Both are higher than other 6.0 fighters, but when compared to other starter jets, the RP modifier is average, while the SL modifier still remains above average. The HE-162A2 gets access to three skins. The default skin is a basic late war skin with the top paint a green and the bottom a grayish white. To spice things up, I've thrown a Wolf Jaws decal on the nose that I flipped and mirrored just to give it that little bit of extra character. The second skin can be unlocked using 200 GE or by getting 143 kills with the plane and RB. This is a prototype camouflage that uses a universal gray color. There's nothing special about this skin, so I'd just grind it out the old fashioned way. It's not really worth a GE in my opinion. The final skin is a Marketplace skin currently going for around 20 cents on the Gaijin Marketplace. This is a historical skin based off of the HE-162 flown by Gerhard Hanf of 2nd Gruppe JG-1. It's a very good quality skin and for only 20 cents it's worth picking up to help out the skin's creator, RMK-18. It makes excellent historical and semi-historical skins for all kinds of aircraft on War Thunder Live. In fact, I used another one of his HE-162 skins in the background footage, so I'll leave a link to that and to his War Thunder Live account if you want to go check him out. With the skins covered, let's move into the cockpit. It's pretty obvious this is an old cockpit judging by the textures. The 162 has been in the game since before War Thunder went into open beta, and I don't think the cockpit's been updated since. Visibility-wise, it's actually really good out of the front and sides. However, looking behind you, there's a pretty big problem. Your engine blocks a good portion of your view directly behind and to the high 6 o'clock position. You can sort of get around this by leaning to the side, but this is definitely a giant blind spot on the plane. Coming back to the front, let's take a look at the instrument panel. Starting on the top left, we find the turn and bank indicator. Below that is the radio homing indicator, but you don't have to worry about this one as it doesn't have any function in game. Moving up and to the right, we have our airspeed indicator displaying in kilometers per hour. Below that is our altimeter that uses meters, and on the top of the next row is our rate of climb indicator that displays in meters per second. Below that, we can find a compass, and then as we continue to the right, we find the start of our engine controls. This right here is the engine exhaust temperature gauge, and below that is the oil pressure gauge. Then below those two, you can find your clock. Moving to the top of the next row, we find our differential pressure gauge, which I don't think works as I've never actually seen the needle move. Below that is the fuel pressure gauge, which does in fact work, and on the bottom is our fuel gauge. This is another gauge that doesn't work, sadly. On the final row, we have our engine RPM gauge on the top, and below that is an ammo counter for both of your guns. There is no HUD to go over in this jet, all you have is a basic holographic gun sight. However, there is one more thing I wanted to point out that's a pretty cool little detail that can be found in the cockpit. That being the window below the control panel. This lets you see into the nose wheel well and can be handy for letting you know when your gear are up and down and is just generally a fun thing to look through. Alrighty, that about wraps everything up, so let's go over the pros, cons, and then finish with my final verdict. Starting off with the pros, you have the fastest top speed of any 6.0, and when in a down tier, this gives you a larger range of action than any other prop fighters you'll face or that you've even flown beforehand. It also lets you run away from danger if someone tries to jump you. Next, the HE-162 is a pretty nimble little jet, especially for the first few turns. Finally, along with that maneuverability is the excellent defensive flying characteristics this plane has. When flown well, the 162 is a damn hard plane to hit. Moving over to the cons, like a lot of other early jets, you're pretty slow to accelerate. These early jets just don't give you the same acceleration that props or later jet engines do. Moving on, you're then hit with a double whammy of poor energy retention on top of this slow acceleration. So if you're not careful and bleed all of your speed in a dogfight, it's going to take you a while to gain that back. And finally, the 162 has a high repair cost for a starting jet. This can make it a little unforgiving if you're just getting into jets and trying to learn how to fly them. 
Now to bring everything back together, I do think the HE-162A2 is a good introduction to jets. This plane will teach you to manage your energy wisely, as it's tough to gain, but quickly lost. Still, the good rate of climb, speed, and armament can make it a potent 6.0 support fighter. When flown to these strengths, and with other teammates around, it's a tough plane to deal with. While some may find the boom and zoom playstyle boring, I personally enjoy it. Hopefully you will too. What are y'all's thoughts on the HE-162? Let's talk about it in the comments, and as always, thanks for watching, and I hope y'all have a wonderful day.